Um, welcome everyone to the panel, and it is called Haunted Spaces, speaking about apartheid legacies. My name is Della Guala, and I will be steering this conversation. Um, when I first heard of the title of this panel, it reminded me of a conversation I had with someone I know who's an architect and actor and artist, and he spoke to me about this movement in art called hauntology. Um, and hauntology is this idea that asks us if we are haunted by the ghosts of lost futures, um, the thought that we can be haunted by what could have been, or haunted by alternative realities that didn't come to pass. Um, it's a concept or term that was created by the philosopher Jacques Derrida, who said that Marxism would haunt Western society beyond the grave that many in the 90s had confined it to. It made me wonder if it was the same for apartheid. Is it a haunting from beyond the grave, or is it something that simply never died? So to dig deep into this conversation, I'm going to turn to our three panelists, um, incredible writers with incredible offerings on the subject of apartheid legacies. And to introduce them, I'm gonna share their bios. Um, since Bronwyn is sitting next to me, I'll start with Bronwyn. Bronwyn is an associate professor and head of creative writing at the University of Witwatersrand, the editor and co-founder of Fourth Wall Books, and a former editor at Art South Africa magazine. She received her doctorate in literature at New York University. She taught writing and literature at New York University and completed an extended internship at the Aperture Foundation in New York before returning to South Africa. She has contributed and edited many books on art, design, and architecture in South Africa, and her latest novel, which we're gonna be speaking about today, is called Notes on Falling. Next up, we have Musa Wengosi Kanile, who was born in 1991 and raised in Seleni KwaZulu Natal. He holds a master's in clinical psychology from the University of Zululand and a master's in creative writing from the University of Western Cape. His first chapbook, The Internal Saboteur, appears in the African Poetry Book Fund's 2019 New Generation African Poets book set. He currently lives in Cape Town and his poetry collection, which we'll be talking about today, all the Places was published in 2019. Um, at the end of the panel, we have Coney Benson, who's a lecturer at the University of Western Cape. Her research is on collective interventions in histories of contested development and the mobilization, demobilization, and remobilization of struggle history in Southern Africa's past and present. She's committed to creative approaches to history that link art, activism, and African history, and draws on critical approaches to people's history projects, popular education, and feminist collaborative research praxis in her work with various archives, students, activists, and cultural collectives in Southern Africa. Kony is the author of Crossroads, I Live Where I Like, and that graphic history is on women's organized resistance to forced removals in South Africa, and will be what we'll be discussing as well today. Um, so moving on from the intros, I'm gonna go straight into each author introducing their writing. I'm gonna start with Kony. Um, in the introduction to Crossroads, I Live Where I Like, the activists slash aunties that you're interviewing ask you to make our history interesting for our children um, because they say our children think our history is boring. So I want you to talk to us about turning this piece of research and this PhD into this graphic history that, as you say, connects art, activism, and African history. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Della, and thank you, everyone, for coming today. Um, you know, I'm a historian and an educator, and I'm amidst poets and writers who are real artists and can speak without notes and make things sound beautiful, so mm. I will try my best. <laughs> um, I want to link your question. That, that was something that many women said um, to me, and another thing that they would 
often say in long conversations was, how do we make sense of this nonsense? How do we take these incredible paths and stories that you might be interested in now and make sense of where they land today? Um, and I would say that just like the making of the, or telling of the history of Crossroads, answering that question is a collective project. So. The book, Crossroads, I Live Where I Like, um, is a graphic nonfiction history of women-led movements at the forefront of struggles for land and housing and what should be public services in Cape Town over the last 50 or 60 years. Women in Crossroads were famous for their collective stance against the apartheid bulldozers, which forcibly removed and relocated 3.8 million black people from their homes and neighborhoods between the 60s and the 80s in a process of enforcing segregation and appropriating land for white people. So drawing on over 60 life narratives, the book tries to tell a story of women who built and defended Crossroads as the only informal settlement that was successful in its resistance to the apartheid bulldozers in Cape Town thanks to the organized resistance of the Crossroads Women's Committee, uh, who were at the forefront of what became a local, national, and international solidarity resistance campaign. Um, but the book kind of goes beyond 1994 into ongoing organizing, and it's a collaboration, and it came out of a three-way conversation between art, activism, and African history. I was doing a PhD asking the question of, how is it possible that we have these famous struggles um, that are celebrated on paper but bear no resemblance to what's going on around us? And in doing the life histories, going back to find those particular women and asking what became of them, but also what became of their struggle, which might have been for forced against forced removals in the 70s and 80s, but turned into struggles for housing today. And then what became of their histories? How have they been used and told and formulated? And those three things kind of took three different strands, and there's not one story for each one of them. Um, and at the time, I was working with activists in trade unions and social movements with the International Labor Research and Information Group in um, at Ilrig at Community House, doing um, workshops around political education with housing activists, um, with sex workers, with domestic workers, with all sorts of frontline grassroots movements. And a lot of the work from the Crossroads history became really relevant and useful in mapping out a long history starting way before 1948 and going way beyond 1994 to understand um, the crisis that we were in and facing and trying to strategize. Um, in intervening in. And so the story became useful in terms of questioning the 1994 divide. And this was in the early 2000s, before Roads Must Fall and Fees Must Fall kind of cracked the widespread denialism that, that things had not changed. And at that time, activists who were instigating protests like the Women's Power Group in Crossroads, it was a four-month sit-in on the council housing offices in 1998. Um, and at the same time, the anti-eviction campaign were also running um, campaigns starting in Mitchell's Plain at that very same time. And this history of Crossroads became more and more important to use. And so I then worked with the Tron Troll brothers, who are um, political cartoonists, incredibly talented and um, insightful from Bishop Levy's looking, and we, we were having conversations about the relationships between Bishop Levy's and Crossroads and the ways in which our histories are divided. Um, and I worked with them then to try to turn some of this 500-page thesis into something uh, more accessible and more usable. And slowly, with the help of unions and then arts organizations and then history departments, there was bits and pieces of funding to be able to actually turn the, the idea of what was in this thesis into uh, chapter by chapter of what's become the book that you're looking at now. Thank you so much. I, I think that's such a great summary of what is celebrated on paper isn't the actual reality of what happened in specific moments in time. And that collection captures a specific moment in time that would have been completely disappeared if it wasn't for documentation like this. Um, I'm going to move on to Bronwyn. 
and I'm going to ask you to introduce your book and also ask you to do a, a reading um, from page 47 and after that reflect on that moment of euphoria and violence that was that 1994 moment. Mm. <clears throat> so I'll start, I'll start by reading, Della. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, so this is a, a short passage that comes um, at the end of a section. Uh, the, the novel has three characters and they, they occupy three parts of the novel. And this is the character Talia's part of the novel. She's a young, she's a photographer um, who's been to New York, lived in New York and come back um, and is making her way as a photographer in Johannesburg. Um, and this is, this is uh, she's, she's preparing work for an exhibition. At the reception desk, Talia waited for Dean to come back out. There was no one else in the room. On the wall in front of her was a large black and white print, a photograph of a dancer. He was barefoot and wearing wide-legged three-quarter length trousers. His torso was naked and he leaned forward, his head thrust out so that he made direct eye contact with the camera. He carried his weight on his bent left leg, almost all of it on the ball of the foot, and the right was extended to the side and pointed. His arms were up and back in a winged formation, the thumb and middle fingers touching. He was both flying and falling, his center of gravity shifting forward so that had it not been for the outstretched arms and the anchoring left leg, he would have overbalanced. The muscles in his shoulders and upper arms were like smooth pebbles under the dark skin and his collarbones made deep declivities that ran around the back of his poised head. It was a superb portrait of momentary stasis and unexploded energy. There was something in the grainy quality of the print, in the space where the image had been shot, in the unflinching gaze and the dramatically held energy of the dancer that was uncannily familiar and that raised in Talia a tiny stab of anxiety of the kind that she had not felt in a long time. Mm. So um, this is a really interesting um, piece that you've asked me to read, Della, because I suppose in a way it, it's part of the philosophical backbone of this novel, which has to do with the idea of falling, um, which I, I realized when I started working on this that I've been interested in for a very long time, and not falling just as a literal thing, but falling as a kind of philosophical and and in later years in South Africa, obviously a political idea. Um, so this particular image is in fact a real photograph of a dancer called Vincent Mansoe, who's um, an extraordinary South African dancer. Um, and what Talia is fascinated with and what I'm interested in looking at in this novel is this, um, this very finely held balance between flying and falling, this sort of very, very tiny moment of stasis that is captured in this photograph where the dancer could overbalance and fall or, or kind of fly. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, this is partly the philosophical idea that this character is trying to negotiate. She came of age in South Africa. She was in high school in the 80s. She worked in a newspaper archive, in a photographic archive, in a newspaper. And so she inherited a photographic language um, that is deeply political, but that she herself can't, she cannot make photographs like the photographs she has grown up with. Mm. Um, she, so what she's trying to do is grapple with what it means to make images in post-1994 South Africa. And when she's in New York, she's, she's struggling to articulate how deeply important those photographs are for her, for her own photographic language, and yet how impossible it is for her to make the kinds of images that, she's, that are part of her photographic DNA, her kind mm -hmm. of visual DNA. Um, so yeah, it's a kind of a, it's a struggle that many of the photographers that I've worked with, that I've written about, that I've talked to, mm. um, 
has to do with um, how it is that we make images in South Africa, how, and in particular photography, which was in a way one of the few places in which to represent what was happening in South Africa pre-1994. Um, and even though South Africans didn't see all of those images, in fact, most of the really important photographs went out of South Africa. Um, and so phot photographers ask themselves, artists in general, but photographers in particular ask themselves, how, how do, in that moment after 1994, how do I make images that are a reflection of that photographic and political history, but how do I move in a new and different direction? Mm. I don't know. I hope that answers your question, Della. <laughs> I, I love that image in the book, and I think later on, um, right after that, Talia describes that transition and that 1994 moment as it feels like we're dying and coming alive at the same time. And I feel like that, that image like carries that idea as well. Um, I'm going to move on to the poet of the group and ask him to please introduce the collection, All the Places, by reading the title poem, which is also called All the Places. Okay. And then after that, maybe speak to us about places haunted by apartheid legacies, which is something that's carried through through so many poems in the collection. Okay. Thank you. All the places he goes to remind him of where he comes from. He cannot escape his background. It's always with him. Like now, seated at a long, shiny ta table in a hotel with colleagues who overlook his township English and laugh kindly at his jokes. He cannot look at, at his sparkling fork and knife without thinking of holidays spent at his father's birthplace, gathered around a huge bowl of mass with his cousins, digging in with his hands. Um, so all the places um, is, uh, I was, the poems that I was writing around that time were uh, about my reflections of growing up in a township. I grew up in Zadeni, which is a township in, um, situated in uh, northern KZN. Um, and I was um, curious about how um, a place influences how one looks at the world, or views the world, and navigates the world. And, 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 and so most of the poems that I was writing at the time were about you know, my um, uh, what I can call township experiences, things that I saw growing up in a township um, most of them were traumatic, of course. Um, and, and so I then decided while I was um, doing um, an MA in creative writing um, at UWC under the supervision of Prof. Moonman, I then decided to um, extend this idea of place and identity, how our identities um, are shaped by the places we grew up in. Um, my mom had, um, so I had some experiences in the rural setting as well, um, because my father being, I, I don't know if I can say old fashioned, had this idea that he would never retire in the township. You know, township is a very, um, it's a very turbulent place. So, you know, when you think of retirement, you want to sit and look at the mountains and stuff. And, and so he decided to um, buy a site uh, at a rural place near um, called Habeni, which is just a few kilometers from, from Eshoi. Um, and he built a, a, play, a house there. Um, I, I didn't like going to this house, uh, but I, would, I was forced to go there on school holidays. And that's how I then got to experience the rural setting. And so some of the poems speak to those experiences in a rural setting. And then after I matriculated, um, I also went to a rural-based uh, university, which is uh, University of Zuliland. Uh, 
And so that was, I suppose, an extension of um, uh, my uh, rural experiences. Uh, it was, you know, sometimes we would be in a lecture um, and, and then a go to just um, stroll past. Um, that's how rural the university was. And, and, and then after I was done with um, uh, internship, um, I got to experience the urban uh, setting for the first time, I think. Mm. Um, I was, when I was, you know, I'm, I'm now working and I'm renting an apartment and uh, I got to experience a, a very different kind of life. And so I wrote about those experiences. And so the book is divided into three chapters. There's the, uh, the rural, the township, and the urban. Mm. Uh, most of the, the poems in the urban section uh, were inspired by my re relocation to Cape Town in 2018. Um, I, I moved to Cape Town to start um, uh, um, working at, at UCT. I don't know why it took a while for me to say that. And, uh, <laughs> I think I had to reflect on that trauma as well, um, and so um, and and so um, when I moved to UCT, I, I don't think it it it, it ever gets uh, more more urban than that, mm -hmm. uh, and and so the the poems in the in the last part of the the book, last section of the book, were inspired by. Um, my experiences at UCT and in Cape Town, uh, uh, navigating Cape Town as, as a young black professional um, and reflecting about my child, um, town, uh, township experiences and how they shape who I am. And also, the, and I suppose there's a conflict between those t township experiences and the experiences that um, of the, the current setting where I find myself now. Mm -hmm. um, so that was a long summary of uh, mm -hmm. how this book came about. I think it's an important summary because, I mean, I think I said to you before we start this conversation that like poetry is like sorcery, it's like magic. You collapse so many aspects of South Africa's different political landscapes, like you said, rural, township, and the suburbs into these incredibly beautiful lines, basically four lines. And I think the alienation that you speak about, particularly with the UCT and Cape Town section, is particularly chilling. So Thank definitely you. appreciate that. Um, I'm going to go back to Kony and ask her more about the disappearance of the women's movement in Crossroads and how that history was um, almost removed thanks to male violence, political collusion, and various things almost completely removed that retelling of that history. Um, so I want to talk more about that. Um, <clears throat> sure. I mean, I, I think I'm, I'm, I want to talk a bit about the backlash in terms of a demobilization. And I think often when we go to hear these stories, we look for the kind of peak moments of organized resistance. And what I realized at the very end was really that those periods in between where it seems like nothing is happening or the after are often so important but so much more hard to find and understand. And I think that there's been really a demobilization and a depoliticization of this history. And so there's a disappearance, but there's also a kind of sanctioned forgetting. And a lot of it has to do with the fact that women in Crossroads um, they had some tremendous victories and there was a lot of unglamorous slog work involved, as anyone here who does any organizing knows. Um, and they turned the building of shacks into a highly visible and political campaign with posters and plays and pickets and direct actions, media campaigns and alliance building, uh, visuals to the point where there was 20 two uh, men in the US Congress who stood up and said, don't demolish crossroads. Um, and it crisscrosses across all sorts of organizing histories in Cape Town. People um, in crossroads came from Claremont, Constantia, District 6, etc. Um, and I think it's 
it's useful to go back to that history in terms of honoring and inspiring struggle, um, but I don't think we can claim any, um, any easy victories, and if we were to just end the story there, um, we would be missing out on what were some victories in an ongoing war. So if we follow past the kind of peak or heyday, uh, we get into some really, really messy uh, territory. So to talk about the disappearances, I want to talk about reconfiguring or reframing this history. So women in the, in the 1970s and 80s who were involved in Crossroads, um, as many people will know, their gains were pushed back uh, through what is often just called vitduka, or the vigilante uh, uh, organized um, burning out of Crossroads in May 1986. And this was state-sponsored, um, where the camp was set on fire and 70,000 people were chased out. Um, and 30,000 were selectively let back in, and the state was there with vans waiting to take people to uh, these army tents that had stood empty for a year on sand dunes 30 kilometers away, which is now known as Kailicha. And for a year, people had been resisting going to Kailicha, and women in Crossroads had been saying, not only do we refuse the passes and the idea that we can't be in the city, um, but we also are resisting going to Kailicha, and it's the Vitduka burnout that caused those first residents to flee there. Um, and once the camp was, once those 30,000 people were let back in, um, this was a collusion between certain vigilante leaders. So I think it's important not to pit the story as just women against men, but there were generational and gendered tensions there where a few specific male leaders had made these alliances with the state. Um, and when they came into leadership, all women were dismissed from any committees. Um, and I think there's a lot of work to be done that looks into the effect, the gendered effects of Vitduka or just gendered effects of militarization. Housing allocation was then militarized for the next 10 years. There were a, 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 a semi-civil war over the few houses that were actually built in the area. All progressive links were cut, um, et cetera. So there's a whole range of things that happened. But then the history was also, in a way, disappeared in that there was a freeze framing. If you go onto the ANC website today, you'll see, uh, like, thank you to the women of Crossroads who helped fight against apartheid and made such a big difference. But um, there's nothing since then, and there's no going back to those particular women, many of whom were chased out of Crossroads um, in the subsequent years. And then, 20 years later, in the exact same place, facing some of the exact same male figures of authority, the women's power group came together, and it was 300 women from across crossroads, from different political parties, from different geographic areas, uh, different histories, and they came together to form what they called the women's power group. And they say they called it the women's power group because they said it meant that women had the power to solve problems without using violence. So they were trying to avoid the gun violence that was associated with not just the older organizing, but the ongoing organizing post-1994, where the counselor was known as Counselor for Life, and he had his own you know, private security. In, during the four-month sit-in in 1998, outside of the housing offices, um, all sorts of tensions erupted, and that was a lot of settling of old scores from the past you know, 10, 20 years. Um, and it was extremely violent. Some of the women I interviewed, uh, one person, her partner was killed at his funeral. Her mother was stabbed to death. The counselor was seen to be using um, state security. It, it was um, really complicated, uh, really violent. And the commission of inquiry, there's, there's been many uh, commissions of inquiry into issues in Crossroads. And that commission, um, you can read it and see what questions women were asked. Um, and, and they'll answer things like, no, uh, yes, I was part, I'm part of PAC, but this wasn't about PAC. Or, for example, um, during the first few days of the sit-in, um, some top ANC officials came went from the Women's League and told the ANC women to leave the protest, and they didn't. They said, this is not about ANC-PAC, this is about looking at um, 
money that's supposed to be spent on water, housing, education, and roads in Crossroads. We want to know where that money has gone and why these houses haven't been built. And when they are built, why are they built? They're, they're way too small, they're inadequate, etc. And so what happened is that in that commission and in the official story of what happened after the sit-in, they say this was an ANC-PAC battle that took place. There's nothing about the women's power group and the actual demands that they were trying to make. Um, and so I think that the ways in which, and it was never associated with earlier generations of organizing in Crossroads. And in fact, I'd spent almost every single day in Crossroads interviewing people about the 70s and 80s and heard about the women's power group from reading a commission that I ran into in digging through the archives um, in the manuscripts collection at UCT. So to then go back and try to figure out how are these histories disconnected and what has been that process of um, backlash. And then finally, in that 1980s violence, it wasn't just that there were vigilantes who allied with the state. The state had an entire plan of counter-revolutionary guerrilla warfare. They had manuals developed that used strategies from Cambodia, Vietnam, from around the world. And they were instigating what they called LIC, low intensity conflict. And the idea in it, and you can read it, they say the best thing you can do is you can undermine communities from within. You can rip the social fabric. And they did it by the book and it worked. And so although often in the, and so in the media, it would be black on black violence and vigilantes and crossroads, but that kind of not just um, collusion, but that um, plan, that's on the military or policing level, but on the economic level, and this is something that I think has to come back into public conversation, is that neoliberalism entered South Africa in the 80s during the peak of the struggle where, you know, the, 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 the money, the urban foundations, the Oppenheimers, the reformers were looking at what was going on, thinking it would be cheaper if we just got rid of like the past system and the, the laws. And they took race off the books, but not class. And we know that, you know, the, the, the racial capitalism doesn't work like that. And so there was a specific program that they called orderly urbanization, and they needed to manufacture violent stability. And they had housing plans that excluded and that privatized and commoditized housing. And so that all came in at the same time. And I think that because often that's left to like, oh, the economists can explain the economy to us, um, there's very little connection between experiences of forced removals and then the plans that were coming in and have become our housing policy. Um, the last thing I'll say is that often people will point to 1996 and say that when RDP beca became gear and South Africa imposed or a self-imposed structural adjustment program, those austerity measures of rolling back mass social spending, housing, etc. they didn't start in 1996. They started in negotiated settlements in the 80s. And uh, in Cape Town, the state was intent on forcibly imposing that on crossroads. And I think that that's the model that we, that we have now. And so the story of women in crossroads can be told as something heroic and very long ago. It can be told as a gendered story. But the minute you bring it in to talk about the current housing crisis and the ways in which we spend more on policing, shack dwelling than we do on building housing, it also then feeds in, I think, to the disappearance of the real significance of the story of crossroads. Mm. I think. <clears throat> Sorry, I think one of the things that struck me in the graphic history was the conversation about um, the bylaws and how bylaws in Cape Town were used um, in the housing struggle to evict people because it immediately brings me to the present how the city of Cape Town continues to use bylaws to evict people, to um, create even more hostility towards homeless people in the city as well. So I think that that whole idea that this carries to the present is, is so true. Um, sticking to sort of memories on violence, I'm gonna take it to Bronwyn and ask you about the protagonist of Notes on Falling, talks about being haunted by the newspaper archive um, that's related to apartheid violence. So I want you to speak to me more about that that haunting um, 
Yeah. Um, as I was saying earlier, Della, um, what the character is trying to come to terms with is, is a way of describing the world that, mm. um, that, that brings into her work the, the photographic language that she's inherited, but that, but that um, tries to reshape that or reformulate that language. And in fact, a lot of what I'm doing in this novel, not just with photography, but with the history of dance, mm. Um, there's, a, there's a character in the novel who goes to New York to be a dancer and encounters in the 1970s um, the kind of dismantling of the dance language that had sort of dominated um, dance in Europe and America and, and, and um, kind of formal dance in South Africa. So she's a ballet dancer who encounters this extraordinary dismantling and rewriting of dance into, uh, into movement, mm. um, which is deeply political um, kind of address to the past that, mm. that many of the artists in New York in the 70s, in this, going back as early as the 50s, but the period that I'm particularly interested in is, is the 1970s. So there's a, kind of, there's a kind of universal unpicking of those histories, those formal histories, the language of those formal histories, and photography is just one of those languages. Um, so maybe I'll just read a little passage that sort of encapsulates her own attempt to come to terms with that. Mm. She's having a conversation with a friend in New York. Talia leaned back against the couch trying to frame her next thought. It's not a single event like, like the assassination of Kennedy, say, but a whole series, one after the other, that are being made into history, and you're inside of it and have to make sense of it, visually, I mean. You're not writing journalism like my dad, so you don't need immediate facts, but you need to be able to see what's happening. And if you can see, if you have any idea of what's going on, how do you point your camera away from the event but still say something interesting? Not abstract or just beautiful. She was slightly breathless. Kennedy's assassination wasn't a single event, James said after a while. It was also a series of things. Yes, but the pure event of it, the absolute pure instance of that shooting, it's so strong, it stands out as a single moment, separate from all the others. We also had assassinations right up to the elections, but they weren't visible in the same way. Talia looked at the clock in the kitchen and saw that she would be late if she didn't leave soon. I suppose what I'm trying to say is how do I resist looking for an event to hang things on, a single drama? We've had a lot of those in South Africa and they're important and make for fantastic images, but I'm not so interested in those as pictures. You don't want a singular image. Yes, exactly, I don't want iconography, which is why New York is such a dangerous place for a photographer for a filmmaker too, I suppose. So, so what she's saying is that it's easy to, um, to it's e particularly for her as a South African living in New York, it's easy to make pictures of an ac iconic place like New York, to make iconic images, to take pictures that immediately are recognized as, as a particular place. She's trying to find another way of making images that is significant but it's not about iconography. Mm. So, yeah. I think, <clears throat> sorry, in the book you touch on this idea of not trying to freeze one event in one moment mm. and make that be um, the moment that's frozen, but rather the whole, how do you capture the whole series of events that happen? And I think there's a line where a character talks about um, history being something that's only collected and put together yeah. in the future. Yeah. That it's moments that happen but are only made sense of and created a narrative around once they've happened yeah. um, retrospectively, yeah. I guess. Yeah, um, and just, I mean, listening to Kony talk about um, the ways in which history is being made, you know, for this project that she's worked on, um, what Talia recognizes is that history, or what she learns, is that history, um, there are many histories, and people do 
invent history. And it's a very different kind of, that kind of history is a very different kind of history to the kind of history in which you are inside of the moments that are unfolding and are trying to describe them because they're important for your very life, mm. um, which is the kind of history that, that I think Kony's talking about. Okay. Mm. Yeah. Going back to Musa Wengosi, I... You, you, can, I, you can call me Musa, it's fine. I can call you Musa. <laughs> <laughs> I can, I, 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 I'm using the name that was yeah. mailed to me, so Musa. The, Such a long name. Um, it is. <laughs> <laughs> I, before we move on to the audience questions, I'd like to touch on the theme of creative practices healing, because that's something I'm deeply interested in. So I wanted to ask you about, um, is writing creatively about trauma a means of healing? Um, especially when it comes to all of the tender moments that you write about. I'm thinking about all of the, the love stories in your collection um, that are there even in moments of intensity and violence. So I'd like to ask you about creative practices healing and what you think about that? Um, hmm. I have to be careful here because, you know, I don't want to um, uh, create a wrong impression that if you write poetry, then you don't need to go to therapy. <laughs> um, but, you know, the, the interesting thing about uh, creativity or, or art is that um, so it, it 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 sits in the very same brain where trauma sits. Um, so there is this idea about the right brain and the left brain. So the right brain being the emotional brain. Um, it's the same brain that we use when we are creative, when we are composing music. Um, or writing poetry, when we use um, metaphors, um, you know, it's the creative brain. Um, but it's also the same brain where our emotional trauma sits or resides. Mm -hmm. So I've always been struck by that coincidence that the very same brain that is traumatized is also creative. Um, but I think that the idea of healing was oneself through, through art or through music or, or, or poetry in this case. Um, it, it, it does some work, but, but you know when you're writing poetry, you are alone with your trauma. Uh, and as human beings, we have blind spots. Um, and, and most of the... Um, the there are things that we are not aware of, you know, because you are reflecting alone there. Um, and, and I think the idea of healing is amplified when you are sitting with another person who's empathetic and understands your, your pain. Um, so I, I, if, if you ask me how, uh, what impact poetry has had, in my life, I would say, um, I was quite shocked. Uh, for a long time, I didn't even know about emotional trauma or trauma, um, because I was just a kid growing up in the township. But when I started, and because of the line of work that I do, um, I think a lot about trauma, the impact of trauma. So when I look back, the poems that I used to write, um, uh, as a teenager, I was, I was quite shocked about the things that I was going through. Um, some of the poems that, I, that still uh, move me, um, uh, not because of their creativity, of course, but because of the content. Mm. Um, there is one poem that I almost included in the book. Um, it, it was a poem that I wrote um, for my friend who was um, stabbed to death I was doing grade 11 at the time. He was my childhood friend. He lived just um, a house opposite mine. Um, and, and I wrote that, that poem you know, after it happened. 
And so I think poetry did play a role in, in helping me you know, process all of that. Uh, but um, I, I am in, in therapy as well, so, so you know, poetry is not enough. <laughs> yeah. If only it was. Woo. Then all, our, all the writers would be healed. Um, okay. We have 15 minutes for questions from the audience, and there are roving mics, and we, I've been asked to tell you to stand up when you address the panel. I see one question over there. And then, so we'll start over there, and then we'll come to the front here. Thanks for a lovely panel. Uh, can everyone hear me? All good? Um, I think what, it's interesting, having gone to two talks earlier, uh, this feels like one where the focus is on more on aesthetics and politics, you know, like that sense of each of you from your different angles um, is uh, kind of talking about how art forms relate to much bigger things and that kind of thing. Is there a sense in which, um, in which pursuing art or pursuing poetry or, or photography or so forth in these characters or pursuing writing as a whole is um, is an alternative, a true escape from politics, or a way that, or a language through which that can be accessed, mm. or all those separate parts of yourself that can be compartmentalized? Mm. That Sorry if, it, if that was a complicated question, but I think I'm going to ask Bronwyn in particular to answer that because that is like a central theme in your book: is do you create art for art's sake, right. or? Can you divorce art from politics? I think that's something that's explored. Will you explore? Well, I don't. It would be like asking whether you could divorce yourself from politics, and I don't think, um, um, and I don't think one can. Even if the way you express yourself politically is not, um, I mean, there are many ways. There are many ways to express your political beliefs and values. Um, but you're always embedded in them. So whether you choose, so I would say to answer the first part of your question, art or writing is not an escape from politics at all. It's a processing of politics in the very broader sense. Um, and there are different ways to do that. There cannot be one, only one way to do that. I think there are multiple complicated ways in which one processes one's life in general. So, um, yeah, if, you, if you're living your life and you're writing, you are, you're, in, you're embedded in the history that you inherit, you're embedded in the politics you inherit. How you work it out is really very idiosyncratic and very much up to the individual writer. Mm. Yeah. I don't know if the, any of the other two panelists would like to speak on that more. No. Oh, fine. Okay. Um, I saw a hand. Of, oh, no. You were just stretching. Okay. <laughs> um, ooh, I'm, I'm trying to shield myself from the light. Is there anybody else? Ooh, audience participation. Ooh, there's a hand over there. Um, Hi, um, it's a question really to Kony and I suppose to others as well. She says that her book was a collective project and you were translating, I, I suppose, text into pictures. So I just wanted to ask about the creative process of making the book. Um, what was it like to work not as a single author, but how did the, the narrative and the history change when you had multiple perspectives? and when you translated it into a visual form. Okay, um, thank you. So um, I worked, first I guess I would say it was collective in the conversations that were had with people in Crossroads over many years in terms of taking those stories back and checking those stories and asking if what I was interested in, and interestingly, um, the first interviews I did with people, I asked them about all the places they had ever lived until they ended up where we were sitting today. And so that would go back from where people were born, and in each context I was asking them about 
you know, what, what life was like and the politics and the gender division of labor and households and all, all of that, what was important to them, but I was tracking it almost through uh, stories of migration, mobility, displacement, um, because a lot of it was about histories of forced removals, but I don't think the kind of urban history can be, you know, dis, dis, uh, dislocated uh, from rural history or the land question in general. And so there was a creative process there, I think, in having those conversations across race, across class, across um, generation, uh, across language, etc. And often then we would have group discussions as well because the book really is two collective biographies. And so in the process of creating a social history, how do you decide how to tell a story that is true for a group and include, but not necessarily, these are not 60 biographies or 60 life narratives. So how do you decide what's in and what's out? And I think between that and then the conversations with activists who are um, continuing to organize for housing in terms of what should be in and what should be out. So then I worked with the Trontral brothers and uh, with Andre and Nathan Trontral and Ashley Murray. And I would give them archival photos, uh, posters, newspaper, but then a lot, of, a lot of people's lives were not captured on film. In Crossroads, people experienced multiple forced removals and do not have family photographs. Their documents were destroyed over and over again. And so one of the ways that I know that their work is magical beyond my opinion of their work is that when older women look at, uh, veterans from Crossroads look at the book, it's like a retroactive photo album. They're like, I remember that day. And often that day, there's nothing visual that you can give an artist to draw that day. So it's drawing from those stories. And it's the details in those stories that mattered. So I'll give an example. There's on the cover, actually, there's a picture of Mama Yanta. She was um, the first chair of the Crossroads Women's Committee. And when she got violently chased out of Crossroads, one of the things that was the most difficult for her to tell and speak about was the fact that not only had she been a leader, she had dedicated her entire life to this struggle and then been chased out um, of the house that she had finally gotten in New Crossroads, but she was chased out without even a moment given to her to cover her head. So in other photographs of a lot of women who were involved in protest in general, or even specific women from Crossroads who you could find a picture of them from an affidavit or from a political protest that a photographer had taken, you know, and was in the press and whatnot, the way they had first drawn the picture, and I had taken portraits also as I did the interviews, and every, as I did interviews, people were given back their interview transcribed and translated between Klosa and English, plus a photograph, a whole entire kind of life history for their family. Um, so there were portraits taken in the 2000s, and then there were archival photos of either them or people who would have looked, like could have had the same styles. And so Mama Yanta would always have her head covered, always, in a duk, in a beret, in whatnot. And so, I had to go back to Andrea and Nathan and be like, okay, in this picture, in this one square where Mama Yanta is being chased, and it's a tiny little picture, you can see on the cover, she's sipping tea telling the story, um, because it was important to get a sense of who was telling the story, I think. Um, she's, her head is covered, but the tiny little image of her running in the background as her house is being burnt, they had to redraw because her head originally was covered and needed to be uncovered. So for her, that was an important kind of moment. And so there's, there was a lot of creative license. And Andre and Nathan were very clear. Nathan said to me, we are not doing a educational manual here. Like this needs to be funny, it needs to be appealing. Um, and so we would have these back and forths about how many words can be on a page, you know, um, and what images and what's too risky and what, what's funny and what is not funny at all, etc. And how do you draw metaphors? So, for example, at the peak of this struggle were these um, fights between hardliners and reformers in government about how do we deal with protest and, you know, basically what I would call a sinking ship of apartheid. And so Andre and Nathan then drew 
these two people struggling over who's going to sail, like who's going to have control over the steering wheel of this ship. Or one woman would say something like, when the pot was ready, the men began to fight, for example. Is what, so then there's a woman tasting soup. Like you see the metaphors drawn in there, um, in part so that an entire 10 pages, the main point of 10 pages could be drawn into one square. So for me, the, it, was right, it was important to get the chronology right. Um, and there's nothing in there that is fictional. But often there wouldn't be a particular picture of someone. So the styles, looking at styles of the 70s and 80s is really fun. Um, but to get the style and the look of the landscape of what crossroads would look like or when people would go to protest in town, what town would look like, um, etc. So pulling out as much archival visuals but then figuring out what are the key stories and then what are the key kind of bigger picture themes that needed to be flagged throughout and that was in conversation with contemporary activists. So it was a, it was a back and forth. It was a 10 year, you know, labor of love and many other <laughs> less fun things. Um, but I think trying to, trying to have all of those pieces come together, which none of us could have done um, alone. Do we have any more audience questions? Because if not, I'm going to steal audience time to ask my own questions. Um, I'm going to take this time and ask Musa one more question. Um, in a poem called Find the Truth, for Zamo, you write, what I want you to know is that there isn't much truth in the township. And I was wondering what that truth is, or what is the lie, or what is the falsehood. Um, I was just really struck by that line, so I wanted to ask you about it. I also don't know. <laughs> I'm kidding. I, um, I think I was reflecting on um, the, I'm trying to, to make my response very brief. Um, so, a different examples that one can think of, of falsehoods, mm -hmm. one of them being the, the past um, mark, for an example. Um, you just only need to get 35%, I think, to pass the subject. Um, and even though this, this is not limited to the township, but it affects uh, people who live in the township more than it affects other people um, outside of the township. And, you know, I, um, uh, back in the day, we would um, uh, drink Hennessy uh, and, and, and drive in GTIs. Uh, and then go sleep in uh, a single bed, um, you know, in a four-room house. Um, so there is that idea of, you know, what success means. Um, um, and there is the idea of, you know, there is this, um, people gravitate towards, you know, brand labels, um, being seen to be successful then, being really successful. So I've, I was just reflecting on all those things. What does it really mean to be successful? And these are questions that, that even come up now where, um, because I work at UCT, most of the students that I see who matriculated in uh, the township um, did very well. Um, some, you know, they were top of the class but when they come to UCT, they struggle. Um, um, less than 30% of, uh, uh, of students um, pass their, finish their degrees within the prescribed minimum number of years. Um, I think it's, what, 24, 26% of people who, you know, only 24, 26% between the, the two. Um, and so there's, uh, so if you make it to UCT, you have to question what does it really mean to be academically strong, uh, because that is also tested. Um, and so you leave the township with everyone praising you, only to struggle in the first semester 
um, and people from other places who've had more resources um, do not go through those uh, unpleasant experiences. So I was just reflecting on those falsehoods. Um, you know, there are so many of them. Um, oh, I have one minute to wrap this up. And yeah, I felt like your poetry was amazing at talking about that constant push to escape, but then the places where you escape to, which is, for instance, UCT or Cape Town, and the hostility and the racism mm. and the um, just oppressive structures you have to face and the alienation to be in those spaces. Um, the ones that are seen as the excess, the success and the spaces that you escape to. Um, and on that very cheery note, I'm going to end this panel. Thank you everyone for attending this conversation. I. Um, I'm so grateful that I got to read uh, these three books and have the conversations with these authors. Please pick up all the places, notes on falling, I don't know if anyone can actually see this, and Crossroads, I Live Where I Like. Um, these are in incredible, incredible reading experiences. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.